there. Does that, does that project? Yes. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, unfortunately, my uh, uh, my videos were supposed to be embedded. I'm going to have to be getting out of uh, this to play my videos. So, so you'll have to bear with me on this presentation. Um, this uh, the, the, the presentation here is probably going to be fairly unique to what you'll see here at this conference, and in fact, in any conference. If uh, I know a few other people have tried to do similar types of things, and uh, I'm very interested in talking to people who are doing similar types of work. Um, the problem that uh, that I'm dealing with, um, and the primary goal of this work, is to improve the understanding of the importance of numeric assumptions on the outcome of an impact of fireball calculation. So. Um, there are what we believe to be rare events where you have an impact. Uh, for, and, and a good example of this is uh, when uh, the terrorists flew airplanes into the World Trade Center buildings and into the Pentagon. But these, these types of uh, fire scenarios also occur in, in normal transportation conditions. Where you have a high-speed collision, a gas tank involved, you have a rupture of the tank, you have a spilling of the fuel, and you have a fire that ensues. Um, this is not a normal type of an event, but uh, I guess we don't deal with normal types of fires in my line of work. Um, we have uh, been developing a methodology to uh, be able to model these types of severe events. And uh, we have a new methodology, and what we wanted to do, at least what this work is trying to get at, is understanding some of the modeling approximations, uh, the effect of some of these modeling approximations on our ability to quantitatively model with accuracy these types of scenarios. So um, I don't have an outline. What I'll present after this slide is I want to give a little bit of a background on the methodology that we're using. And then I'll go into this notional scenario that we've developed. Um, the bottom line is, is there aren't very good data for validating these types of events because uh, as everybody who works in the fire community knows, it's very hard to instrument a fire and get accurate data because, because of the thermal problems. But when you combine that with a structural impact, uh, what sort of uh, instrumentation you can, can you put in there that will give you in situ data? Uh, the answer is probably not much. And so we have a very difficult problem with uh, not having a lot of data. So that's why we're resorting to a code to code comparison to understand our accuracies. Um, at Sandia National Labs, we have uh, what's called the Sierra Code Infrastructure. It's an open source uh, uh, code infrastructure that's designed uh, to allow multi-physics computations. And uh, within this code infrastructure, we have a Presto code, which is developed for solving structural dynamics. And uh, a code we call Fuego, in this community, at least in this conference, is probably an obvious uh, uh, description of the fire code, but uh, we use it for predicting uh, reactive flows. Um, and then I'll, I'll get in and, and show the assumptions later on what, what we're evaluating with our uh, problems. So um, the scenario that we're simulating is fairly trivial. We, uh, we have a 23 centimeter uh, square, uh, cube rather, of, of liquid, um, 2.45 centimeter, centimeters thick, uh, uh, aluminum tank, and then there's two adjacent aluminum uh, squares on either side of this, this tank. Uh, we are moving this tank at a, at a speed of 182 meters per second into a, in, an immobile target. Um, and this is a, a purely notional scenario. It's not meant to be anything that we're, we're really trying to test with. Um, we're, we used four levels of uh, smooth particle dynamic, smooth particle hydrodynamics uh, simulation and four levels of refinement within our Presto code to model this. This being our coarsest resolution. Um, for our Fuego simulations, our reactive flow simulations, we're assuming that we're functioning in an open air environment. The ground is located 6.35 meters below our impact point. Um, and then just some minor details with our modeling, we uh, use the EDC uh, model for reactions and an in-house, uh, best, uh, best described as a hybrid model, uh, temporarily filtered Navi Stokes uh, uh, for the turbulence, which is it's basically a hybridization between an LES methodology and a, uh, a K-epsilon type of an approach. And uh, within the fire simulations, we use two, two levels of uh, 
grid refinement. So here's where I'm going to have to escape to show a video. So back in 2003, um, we did a, uh, an experiment where we took a, a large tank of liquid dyed red at high speeds and impacted it into a concrete barricade. And uh, based on that test, and this is really our validation test case, based on this test we were able to collect the liquid as it was collected in pans beneath this. Off to the side at about this location, uh, we had uh, PDPA instruments to measure droplet uh, sizing. And then uh, we also have the videographic evidence of the, uh, the liquid spread, ultimately how far the liquid ended up in the plume. And uh, so this is really uh, our source for data for this type of uh, uh, scenario, uh, for validating this type of scenario. Let's see. Again, I apologize for this. I seem to have done something to the screen. Anyhow, we also have uh, photographic evidence. This is a camera that was located right above the impact point. Um, so our, our confidence in this methodology, uh, uh, it, this, what, what we have here is we have the, the distance at which the, the liquid is spread uh, away from the center point of impact. And we have uh, plotted here a estimate of the drop parcel, uh, parcel density, which is reflective of the mass of the uh, liquid in the water at a distance from the impact point. So visually it was observed that this, this plume of liquid reached approximately 40 meters. Um, and our model predicts a slightly higher uh, ultimate uh, spread distance, but we're, but we're at least within the vicinity of what the data suggests. Our PDP gave us data that was on um, uh, 10 microns, uh, on the range of 10 microns. Our PDPA, unfortunately, was not located in the prime zone of the spray. So, it, uh, but, but we do know that we expect our data to line up within, or at least to encompass that range. And uh, what I've done is I've plotted the uh, mean, let's see, the, the mean is the green and the minimum <coughs> diameter and then the maximum predicted diameter in black. Um, when we used a lower fidelity geometry in our simulations, we didn't encompass that range. But we found that if we use a higher fidelity geometry in our predictions, that we can encompass the range of the data for drop sizes. Um, we found that uh, geometry fidelity was quite important uh, in our liquid pans beneath the target. We uh, collected too much uh, on the predictions. We, are, we were significantly high in this region. We were significantly low in this region in terms of liquid collected. But we believe this to be due, uh, this, is, this was somewhat expected because it's due to the fact that in our modeling, we did not have a, an appropriate model for the impact of a liquid that dropped into the surface and then the resuspension of the liquid. So that type of physics was not well modeled. And we think that's basically the reason for the discrepancy that we have here. If you look, and fortunately we're off the screen right now, but what you're seeing is seven different simulation cases in our data point right here. Um, our total deposited mass uh, was for the most part within the range of the data, which gives us a reasonable amount of confidence in this methodology. Um, what we have there are also videos, and I'd like to show them so you can get a sense for what you're looking at. Um, so this is, a, this is a prediction from our Presto code, our structural mechanics code. This is an SPH simulation. It was approximately, uh, this was, uh, 100 processors for a couple of days uh, uh, calculation time and uh, on the order of a half million uh, particles representing the, the liquid water. Um, so this simulation goes out to a, a little beyond 0.1 seconds. Um, that is our uh, Presto calculation. We then transfer that into our fire code which is then used to predict the ultimate spread of the, uh, on the scale of uh, five-ish seconds, the ultimate spread of the, uh, uh, the liquid in this impact scenario. Okay, so let's uh, get back to the presentation.